Good day everyone and welcome to our class. This is the Contemporary World and today our discussion will be focusing on political globalization. This is political globalization reminding everyone that the slide material I am using right now is solely owned by Professor Jed Olibor Castilla. Again, our discussion for today is all about political globalization. Here we will divide this lesson into four. First, from patriarchy to monarchy. Second, from monarchy to the rise of democracy and communism. Then, the great rivalry, democracy versus communism. And the post-Cold War world. First, let's look at from patriarchy to monarchy. This is how the nomadic societies evolved into city-states, kingdoms, and empires. The Primitive Times In the beginning, there were nomadic families and clans who were hunters and gatherers, and the decisions of these families and clans were made by their head. It was very much a patriarchal society. Then came the Agricultural Revolution. The people learned agriculture, and this revolved into an agricultural revolution. There were domestication of animals instead of hunting, and there were cultivation of crops instead of gathering. Clans settled beside rivers, like the Mesopotamian River, the Nile River, the Indus River, and the Wangho River. These became the permanent settlements of these families and clans, and they no longer were nomadic. People built cities beside the great rivers. Then came the rise of the city-states, the kingdoms, and empires. The cities governed by the powerful person, whom the people acknowledge as their political leader. The leaders protect their people, and the city state from raiders and rival city-states. The leader is a strong man of war. The city-states evolved into kingdoms. Formation of social classes took place. The leader's clan became the top class coming from the nobility. The monarchy was established, and the monarchy became an inherited leadership. This is also when taxation began. Kingdoms invaded other kingdoms. One emperor ruling several kingdoms. The Basil kings and governors were under the emperor. These are the examples of ancient empires in the Middle East, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. In Central Asia, we have the Mongol Empire. In Southeast Asia, we have the Khmer Empire and the Srivijaya Empire, while in the Americas, the Maya Empire and the Aztec Empire, and the Inca Empire. These are the examples of empires during the Middle Ages. In the Middle East, the Islamic Empire, while in Europe we have the Byzantine Empire and the Holy Roman Empire. Then came the Age of Mercantile. This is when the quest for gold and spices became a thing, because the more gold you have, the more powerful you are. And spices were made for food preservation because refrigerators were not invented yet. These led to the exploration and discovery of new lands, when the Western European kingdoms built overseas empires. These are the examples of empires during the age of mercantilism in Europe, the Spanish Empire, the Portuguese Empire, the Dutch Empire, the French Empire, the British Empire, and the Belgian Empire. In the age of mercantilism, monarchy continued to be the political order. Emperors ruled their motherland in Europe plus their colonies in other continents. The world order, Europe became the seat of power while Asia, Africa, and the Americas subdued people and territories. Australia became the penal colony of the British. Then, 
we will proceed with the second part, the birth of democracy and communism. Here we will look at how the monarchy gave birth to democracy and how the Industrial Revolution gave birth to communism. The Rise of Democracy Monarchs and emperors were mostly despotic due to their absolute powers. In France, these resulted to a revolution which was called as the French Revolution. These was the first revolution that led to democracy. Here, the French king was killed by the peasants, and there was no more monarchy. A parliament was formed to run the country, and the people elected representatives to the parliament. Other European countries followed the French model. Kings lost their absolute powers. Parliaments took care of the governance of their countries. The concept of equality of the people came into being, and there were more liberties or freedom for citizens. In the Industrial Revolution, European countries developed machines for mass production. Factories were established. There were mechanized farming and mechanized transportation. Coal-powered factories and vehicles were established. But, there was great damage to environment, and there were poor labor practices. The Industrial Revolution made the Western European empires more powerful economically and politically, like England, France, Spain, Germany, Belgium, and Holland. The United States of America also became like the Western European powers. The birth of communism. Because of the Industrial Revolution, two social classes became more defined the capitalists and the masses, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. The capitalists were the rich people and the factory owners, while the masses are the working class, the laborers, and the factory workers. These was how Europe looked like back in the 1800s. The capitalists oftentimes exploited the laborers, and there were no more equality of men. Karl Marx, a German philosopher living in England, observed this, and he hated the exploitation of the masses by the elites. He dreamt of a classless society and hatched the idea of communism. He wrote two books, the Das Kapital and the Communist Manifesto, which became the Bible of Communism. Communism was never applied in Marx's lifetime. 1917, it was Russia, which was the first country, to apply communism. Then it led to the Russian Revolution, it was led by Vladimir Lenin, and ended the democracy or the monarchy in Russia, and started the Soviet era. Lenin confiscated all the wealth of Russia and distributed it equally amongst the people. He set up a communist government which is iron-fisted. The communist Russia invaded 40 neighboring countries and integrated them in the Soviet Union. It was also called as the USSR or the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. In 1950, China followed the Russian model. Mao Zedong drove away Chiang Kai-shek to Taiwan, and Mao set up a communist government in mainland China. Now let's look at the world wars and the Cold War. Here we will look at the great rivalry between democracy and communism. But before that, let's review first where we are right now. Again, this lesson is divided into four parts. First, from patriarchy to monarchy. Second, from monarchy to the rise of democracy and communism. Then, the great rivalry, democracy versus communism. And lastly, the post-Cold War world. Let's go with the World War I and World War II.
Then came the World War I and World War II, which caused the powerful nations to polarize. They were grouped together and fought each other. The World War I Axis powers included Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire, while the World War I Allied powers were the United States, Great Britain, France, the USSR, and these four countries were considered as the Big Four. And then we have Japan and Italy. And then in the Second World War, here are the Axis powers. We have Germany, Italy, and Japan. While the Allied powers of World War II were the United States, Great Britain, France, and the USSR. The Axis power were fascist and monarchical. The Allied powers were democratic and communist. The Axis powers lost in both wars. After World War II, the Big Four became even more known as the Undisputed World Powers. The Big Four, the United States, France, and Great Britain were democratic countries, while the USSR continued to be a communist country. After the First World War, the League of Nations was formed. Its objective was to preserve world peace. At its peak, it had 58 members. However, there were disagreements among members which resulted to the withdrawal of some of them. And it failed to prevent the Second World War. At the end of World War II, the League of Nations was abolished. It was replaced by the United Nations. From 51 member states in 1945, today the United Nations has 193 members, the purpose of which is peacekeeping. Later on, health, food security, environmentalism, and the likes became additional objectives of the United Nations. After the Second World War, the colonies of the empires were released. The United Nations called these as the decolonization or the decolonization of the world. Economic losses during World War II caused Great Britain, France, and other European powers to give independence to their colonies. The Philippines became independent. Also India, Indonesia, Malaysia, and many African and Middle East countries. The New World Order, First World, Second World, and Third World. The First World were rich democratic countries such as USA, Great Britain, and France. The Second World were big, powerful communist countries, the USSR and China, while the Third World is the rest of the, the Cold War. Competition of the First World and the Second World to convert and to keep the Third World countries on their rate respective fences resulted in the Cold War. It was communism versus democracy. It is non-shooting war, but just a war of ideologies. Spy versus spy, like James Munn versus the KGB. The USSR and China funded communist rebels in democratic third world countries to overthrow the democratic government and replace it with a communist one. USA and Great Britain funded the democratic third world to prevent a communist takeover. Examples, Cuba, North Vietnam, and many African countries. The Korean Standoff After the Second World War, Korea was partitioned by the US and the USSR. North Korea became a communist country because of USSR. And South Korea became democratic because of the United States. The Korean War took place in 1950 until 1953. It was North Korea versus South Korea. Communism versus democracy. It was USSR and China that helped North Korea. And the United States helped South Korea. It ended with a stalemate, a draw, or a tie.
the Vietnam War. After the Second World War, Vietnam was also partitioned. North Vietnam became communist because of the USSR, while South Vietnam became democratic because of the United States. In 1965 up to 1975, North Vietnam invaded South Vietnam. The USSR and China funded the North Vietnamese and while USA helped South Vietnam. South Vietnam and the USA lost the war. The first world countries in North America and Europe then formed NATO or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. If one member gets attacked by the communist bloc, the other NATO members would come to the rescue. Fortunately, this did not happen. The United Nations had a hard time doing its job during the Cold War because both the United States and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic were members of the United Nations. For the record, the United Nations deployed peacekeeping forces only on two occasions during the Cold War. During the Korean War in the 1950s and in Congo in the 1960s to aid the government against rebel forces. After World War II, Germany was also partitioned. Also, the city capital of Berlin. West Germany and West Berlin became democratic because of the United States, while East Germany and East Berlin became communist because of USSR. The End of the Cold War In 1989, the East Germans had a people power revolution. They gave up communism and wanted to be democratic. They destroyed the Berlin Wall, the barrier that divided the two Germanys. Where did the East Germans got the idea of a people power revolution? To no surprise, they got their inspiration from the EDSA people power revolution of the Philippines in 1986. After the German experience, many communist countries in Europe followed suit. Democracy-hungry people toppled the communist governments in their countries, like Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Yugoslavia, and even the USSR. By the end of the 1900s, communism was almost dead. The last part, the post-Cold War world, what the world looks like politically today. In the post-Cold War era, Germany became a united democratic country. The other small communist countries in Europe became democratic. The USSR disintegrated. Russia gave independence to the 14 Soviet republics like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Lithuania, Ukraine, and others. Parliaments replaced the communist governments there. China began to open itself to capitalists from the United States, and they allowed U.S. companies to operate in their land, not only Nike, Apple, McDonald's, but many more. Now, almost everything in the world, however, is made in China. Vietnam followed China's example. Communist government, but off open to Western capitalists. Communism evolved into socialism. Socialism politically looks like communism because it only has one political party and nobody can oppose it. The people still do not have rights of speech of press or others. But economically, not all businesses are state-owned. Many companies are owned by entrepreneur citizens and even foreigners. There is no longer equal distribution of wealth. Some communist states evolved into fascist states, including Cuba and North Korea. But lately, Cuban leader Fidel Castro died. His successor became open-minded to partnership with the United States. Also, new North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is having exploratory talks on the unification of the two Koreas. 
Experts claim that sooner or later, communism will be a thing of the past. So where is globalization in our story? The breaking down of barriers between the communism and democracy. The trend, the world is becoming capitalistic and democratic. Postlude, War on Terror Now in the contemporary times, the first world has a new enemy, and the enemy is terrorism. Islamic extremist groups like the Taliban, the Al-Qaeda, and ISIS have launched attacks in the first world. The United States and its allies have invaded countries that they think are cuddling these extremist groups, like the Afghanistan and Iraq. The U.S. put up democratic governments in these invaded countries to replace the Islamic extremist government. Question, is this the price of globalization? The role of the United Nations. The United Nations still exists and in fact has grown even bigger. It recognizes and respects the sovereignty of the states and arbitrates conflict between member states diplomatically. But the implementation of their rulings is up to the states involved, like in the case of the Philippines and China over the South China Sea. They sent out peacekeeping forces but not combat troops in hot spots and aids them in calamities. The synthesis? The trend. The world started with simple nomadic groups here and there. They polarized into settlements, nations, kingdoms, and empires. Through time, borders separated them. Borders may be physically walls or physical walls, borderlines, ideologies like communism and democracy, despotic leaders, wars, economic systems, religion, and the likes. In the contemporary world, these barriers are crumbling down. The breaking down of these barriers and the unification of the world is globalization unfolding right before our very eyes. And that wraps up our discussion on political globalization. Thank you for joining me in our discussion here on political globalization in our course, The Contemporary World. Once again, this is Sir E, your instructor for these course. Stay safe, stay sane, and stay strong, everyone. Until next time, God bless you all.